This video is a collection of most of my previous videos pertaining to Sonic the Hedgehog lore based on either theories I've crafted or were developed by other minds within the Sonic community. Links will be in the description. The goal of this video was to correct any mistakes I may have made while talking about said theories like not properly citing sources or saying one thing and contradicting myself a few minutes later. Along with corrections, you'll be seeing footage updated in certain sections of the video. If you so choose to, please go back and watch the original videos. I think it'll be interesting to spot any changes I make between this collection and the originals. With all that out the way, I leave you to enjoy the video. The lore of the first four Sonic games is incredibly fascinating to me. I especially like how Sonic Adventure 1 further expands upon the lore of Angel Island while giving us clues to how the other settings of the first few Sonic games ended up. Shockingly, I'm not seeing a lot of people either talk about the lore present between the trilogy and SA1, or maybe they're just not aware of it. I'm probably not in the right circles to see this type of conversation happening. But, in doing my own research on areas like South Island from Sonic 1 and West Side Island from Sonic 2, it turned up with very little information. Even websites like Sonic Retro offered very little information about the first two islands. So the aim of this video is to bring to light some of the lore buried deep within the first three Sonic games, and tie everything together at the end with a brief story that I hope makes sense to those of you watching this video. Thanks by the way. Now, originally, this video was going to be part of a longer series. I'm a massive nerd for 90 Sonic Team. That group to me was a force of great ideas and executions when it came to gameplay and storytelling. So, to pay tribute, I was going to make a series of videos which I detailed how Sonic Team crafted their stories through gameplay in games such as Sonic, Nights into Dreams, and Burning Rangers. But, I was having trouble coming up with a way to present the whole nature versus machine ideas so obviously evident in the first three Sonic games with a fresh perspective. In this struggle, I ended up doing much more research into the lore of the islands, which I found infinitely more interesting despite the lack of it I was able to find through surface level research. So naturally, I began to dive deep beyond the surface level. I watched a few Sonic Iceberg videos, read a few forums of Sonic Retro, peeped some fan theories on Twitter, and found translations of the original Sonic game manuals crafted by Sonic Team themselves. These manuals greatly expand upon the story more than what we see in the games, and I recommend giving them a read. It just sucks that the localization team for America came up with their completely separate canon for no real reason, as I find the story of the OG Sonic games much more interesting than the whole Mobius thing which opened up an unnecessary can of worms when it came to Sonic Adventure 1 for Western fans. I'm gonna go in order, starting with info I've gathered for Sonic 1 South Island, then 2's West Side Island, and then finally Angel Island from Sonic 3 Knuckles. Before I do though, shout out to the Great Lange on Twitter. They made a really good Twitter thread that lined up with most of what I was able to come up with on my own. Go peep it, and let's get started with this thing. South Island, a treasure trove of jewels and ruins. It is said that the islands have a mysterious connection to the Chaos Emeralds, a set of powerful gemstones which no one knows how to obtain. The island is constantly moving along the ocean, due to its connection with the emeralds, which exist within natural distortions created by the island. This explains why it's so hard for anyone to find them. In Sonic 1, the 4th level, Labyrinth Zone has some noticeable imagery of what appears to be owls along the background walls and as well as on the ground Sonic walks on. I'll even go a step further and say that these things that shoot out what I'm assuming are fireballs are also depictions of owls or at least some type of other bird due to the beaks that we can see on them. There are also these totem poles seen throughout the Green Hill Zone. Totems, in real life, were used by Native Americans to pass down stories, historical events, and ancestry through generations. Now, I can't read totem poles, but the ones in Sonic 1 seem to be different from the ones found in real life. They rely solely on facial expressions that we could possibly decipher as moments in history. 
the angry expression possibly resembling times of strife and potential battles and wars. The wide-eyed section of the totem signifying the observative nature of the inhabitants throughout their history and the squinted eyes round mouth section of the totem can represent the birds talking, maybe passing along info amongst each other or spreading their knowledge and reach along what I theorize to be a larger landmass that existed once upon a time. If you want better looking versions of the totems, peep the ones from Sonic Mania. They depict the totems as owls, which lends even further credence to the theory that South Island was once home to some ancient bird civilization. From these observations, we can induce that owls, or birds in general, were the dominant species that lived on a portion of a larger landmass that would come to be known as South Island. I'll expand upon that later. Sadly, that's all the info I could get from looking deeper into Sonic 1. Even with the Japanese manuals at my disposal, it didn't really do too much of a deep dive into the things that fans have observed for years, but maybe that was by design, as the notion of a dominant bird civilization can also be seen in Sonic 2. Before we get into that though, the lore behind Sonic 2's West Island is very interesting. A long time ago, the people of West Side Island developed their civilization using a single mysterious stone, hmm, and prospered to their heart's content. However, there were those who tried to misuse the stone for The stone was sealed away somewhere on the island by the gods. That, well, if you can't see what's going on there, then I don't know what to tell you. Although, I'm not too sure about the whole sealed away by the gods thing, but I have my own theory on who those supposed gods were and who exactly was being punished. Nevertheless, the connection between the three islands becomes more and more clear as we go along here. In Aquatic Ruin Zone, the third zone from Sonic 2, the final boss of Act 2 shows two large totems of birds. Now based on what we've gathered from doing some digging into Sonic 1, it's easy to conclude that the bird civilization, rooted in South Island, had an extended reach that we see present in West Side Island. Surprisingly, there is less lore about West Side Island than there was about South Island. West Side Island feels like a small extension of the bird civilization lore from Sonic 1, and a massive layup for what is easily the most interesting of the three islands, Angel Island. The floating island, drifting through the sky, was once part of a continent. The people of the civilization built a peaceful and prosperous one through the use of a certain single mysterious stone. Unfortunately, the elders of this society tried to use the stone's power for evil. The stone's energy went rampant, which resulted in the civilization being completely wiped out and erased from history. Supposedly, after this incident, the gods descended from the heavens and launched this part of the land into the sky, leaving those who survived to learn from the mistakes of those before them and guard the stone, making sure a great evil wouldn't rise to create another catastrophe. There's really only one area in Sonic 3 and K that I want to focus on here, and that's Sandopolis Act 2. In the background, there appears to be hieroglyphics of what I'm assuming to be echidnas and birds interacting. If what I'm assuming here is true, this really shows how overarching the reach of the bird civilization was. And I could finally stop beating around the bush here, as I'm now going to piece together some things before tying it all together. Some additional information. West Side Island and Angel Island both have their own hidden palace zones designed to be places to keep the Chaos Emeralds safe from any potential dangers or people who are trying to use them for their own evil purposes. I even saw someone theorize that Labyrinth Zone from Sonic 1 could be a hidden power zone, so make of that information what you will. So based on all the information that we have here, the first thing we can obviously do is conclude that South Island, West Side Island, and Angel Island were all once connected as a continent. The influence of the birds stretched well throughout this continent, with their homes mainly being based in the region that would go on to be known as South Island. The Enkidnas occupied West Side Island, but their reach was not as wide as the birds. Based on the story from Sonic Adventure, 
It is revealed that the Enchidnas tried to use the power of the Emeralds to extend their own reach. This angered the gods who looked over the Emeralds and caused devastation across the land, which split apart the three islands into what they are today. Now, I will attempt to put together a small story expanding on what I just pieced together. About 4,000 years ago, an ancient society of owls and echidnas discovered the seven chaos emeralds on the continent which they lived on. The seven emeralds, along with the giant gemstone that would come to be known as the master emerald, exhibited such power that the owls and echidnas began to worship them as gods. They built a shrine in a secluded area and left the emeralds there, coming back every now and again to worship the emeralds and seek guidance from them. A mysterious species, known as Chao, were drawn to the emeralds and began to occupy the shrine. One Chao in particular had experienced more exposure to the emeralds than the others and would become an evolved being known as Perfect Chaos. Perfect Chaos took on the role as the overseer of the emerald shrine as well as the Chao who lived there. The Owls and Echidnas would build their own perfect civilizations using the power of the Master Emerald. Perfect Chaos never showed itself to the people, sensing no initial malicious intent from both species. The Echidnas lived in prosperity under a matriarch, but her son, Pekakamek, showed an aggressive side of himself, one that would prove to bring the downfall of civilization if we were to rise to power. The elders realized this and had their own shrines built based on visions they began having. The visions came to them, likely from perfect chaos, communicating to them through the Master Emerald, who warned them of a coming catastrophe if they were not careful. One shrine was known as the Hidden Palace, a place where the Enchidnas would hide the Emeralds in case a great evil tried to take them. The other shrine built foretold the story the elders had visions of. A great dragon-like creature, born from an egg, unleashing destruction and devastation throughout the land. Just as these shrines were completed, Pakakamek's mother passed away before they could attempt to subdue his wicked desires. He was soon crowned as chieftain and immediately began to build a regime to aid him in his quest for power. Under Pakakamek's rule, the owls sensed oncoming tension and prepared themselves for battle. The two tribes came to blows. Pekakamek's daughter, Tikal, shared a special connection with her grandmother and did not approve of the senseless violence and fled to the Emerald Shrine where Perfect Chaos made itself known to her. After spending time with the Chao in Perfect Chaos, Tikal returned to her tribe and desperately tried to reason with her father to put an end to the violence and try to restore peace. Her father obviously disapproved, enamored by the amount of land he had conquered through raw power. He wanted more and concluded that the power of the emeralds would grant him ultimate power. Tikal took one final stand, but her father and his army just would not listen. Tikal and the Chao were trampled, which greatly angered Perfect Chaos. It revealed itself to the Enchidnas and used the power of the seven emeralds to transform into the dragon-like creature inscribed on the murals. Perfect Chaos was close to destroying the entire continent if not the world. But Tikal made one final wish to the Master Emerald to seal perfect chaos inside of it along with herself. The Master Emerald granted Tikal her ultimate wish, and now, with the power of the Chaos Emeralds at her disposal, Tikal scattered them across the continent, carved out a piece of land, and uplifted it high into the sky, hidden in the clouds. In the aftermath of this incident, the remaining members of the Owls began to explore the remaining land in search of the Seven Emeralds. They discovered the one remaining piece of Enchidna civilization. The shrine, which was dubbed the Lost World, foretold the story of the great dragon-like creature that they had seen devastate the continent. Heeding the warnings of the murals, the birds went back on their search for the Seven Emeralds. They managed to find six, with the Sevens being well hidden due to Tikal's power. The Owls resigned their search, using the six emeralds to carve out their own piece of land from the continent, a land that would drift along the sea, in contrast to the floating island that would drift through the clouds. The birds isolated themselves on this island, 
making it their sworn duty to protect the emeralds. They would inscribe their stories through patterns in ruins and totem poles found throughout the luscious green landscapes. These birds would eventually reach the brink of extinction due to their isolation. Some of the remaining few decided to repurpose themselves and seek adventures beyond the sailing island. Other creatures would populate the land over time, eventually naming it South Island. Back on the now floating island, Tikal had instructed the remaining Echidna to protect the Master Emerald and ensure that what happened would never be repeated. Unfortunately, Tikal began having visions of Perfect Chaos's destructive resurrection and a mechanical beast attempting to steal the Master Emerald and use it for evil. However, in her visions, a ray of hope shines through. A hedgehog, outlined with a golden aura, would appear and put a stop to the beast's actions. She created a mural of this prophecy within the hidden palace for the remaining Enchidnas to pass down through the generations before going back to reside within the Master Emerald with perfect chaos, awaiting the day they would inevitably be at odds with the world once again. Sonic Adventure Strategy Guide says it wasn't just the call who listed Angel Island during the crisis, but the remaining Enchidna who wanted to make sure this catastrophe never happens again. That could be the gods referred to in the old manuals. I recognize that I never outright said who the gods were, only implying that it was to call. The Babylon rogues make up one of the few ancient societies that are referenced at many different times in Sonic's world. Their origins and story throughout time has been very interesting. I'm a sucker for Sonic lore, and the Babylon rogues is a wonderful basis for speculation, creating theories, headcanons, and all that good stuff. Once Sonic Riders was confirmed to be canon, I was looking my chops just coming up with ideas for a video about the Babylon Rogues. The only problem? I couldn't really decide on what exactly about the Rogues I wanted to talk about. So instead of focusing on one thing about the Babylon Rogues, I'm gonna focus on many different things for this video. I'm not gonna lie to you, I kinda fell down a rabbit hole for this one, so get cozy. There's a lot to unpack here. The ancient Babylonians are described as genie-like aliens. What the heck does that even mean? Are you telling me that in Sonic's world, they based Eraser Jin off people that look like Jet the Hawk? Well actually, that's entirely possible, but before I get ahead of myself, these genie-like aliens were traveling through space using their spaceship called Astro Babylon. This spaceship will later become known as the Babylon Garden. They were forced to crash land on Earth due to not being able to fully control the arcs of the cosmos. Five ancient stones that the Babylonians created to manipulate gravity and warp drive through space. The cosmos themselves remained in Earth's orbit after disconnection, all falling towards Earth at different points in time. Using the power of the Master Unit draws the other four arcs to it for the purpose of relaunching Astro Babylon back into space. While stranded on Earth, waiting for the day they would be able to return home, the Babylonians begin to build on top of the Astro Babylon, creating the city of the Babylon Gardens in the process. They were able to make the now island float in the air similarly to Angel Island. For as smart as they were, the stranded Babylonians began to build a reputation as a great band of thieves that we now know as the Babylon Rogues. They went on to build a prototype of the Extreme Gear under the 13th leader of the Rogues named Stolen. The Extreme Gear are hoverboards meant to make flying for the birds easier. It was hidden within the garden, having it being protected by a being known in modern times as Shugo Hei, the Babylon Guardian. Now that I think about it, it's wild that Sonic and the gang basically killed the last known ancient Babylonian just to obtain the magical carpet, the first ever extreme gear. Are we the baddies? <laughs> Although it's possible that Sonic and his pals murdered Shugo, it's also possible that the being was simply part of some advanced security simulation program, as when you hit the vase containing the genie, you are transported to a different virtual reality space briefly. During their time of thievery, the rogues were able to obtain two of the cosmos arcs that finally fell towards Earth after orbiting it for however long. They hid them in the Gigan Rocks and Crimson Crater areas of Sonic's world as seen in Zero Gravity. It is said that the ancient Babylonians gave a boy an angel's wing, which allowed him to rule the world. I can only assume that this act led to incurring the wrath of the gods, who buried the Babylon Garden near the Sand Ruins and scattered the Babylonians across the world, stripping them of their technology, resulting in the rogues losing part of their culture over time. The Babylonians would continue to mingle with the population of Sonic's world, dwindling in size over time. 
Jet's father inherited the key to Babylon, the only thing the rogues were able to keep after being punished by the gods. It's a blue cube that can resurrect the Babylon Garden with the power of the seven emeralds. This same key can operate the inner workings of the Babylon Garden and activate the extreme gear prototype. Jet's father would later pass this key down to... Storm the... No, I'm kidding. Jet obviously inherited it. And with Dr. Eggman recently doing research about the Babylonians, the events of the Sonic Rider series would kick off. Alright, so boom, Eggman holds the tournament to collect the seven emeralds, tricks Jet's group into reviving Babylon Garden, Sonic and the homies kill Shugo, Eggman gets salty that the extreme gear is basically the thing he saw from Aladdin, the arcs of the cosmos fall towards Earth, Eggman tries to use them to control the world's robots cause he's stupid, one of the robots under the influence of all five arcs carries them towards Astro Babylon, creates a black hole, destroys Babylon Garden, Sonic and the homies destroy the master core, Astro Babylon is saved and stays within Earth's orbit. The remaining Babylon rogues, Jet, Wave and Storm decide to stay on Earth instead of going back home to their ancestors, continuing to carry on the legacy of the the Babylon Rogues on Earth. With the story of the Babylon Rogues out the way, let's finally dig into some juicy theories that can be extracted or made based on what we have here. Let's start with the possible origins of the Babylonians. So obviously they were aliens, but what if they were more than simply beings from another planet or even another galaxy altogether? In Sonic Rush Adventure, there's this level called Sky Babylon with a story like the Babylon Garden in Sonic's world. After the floating continent fell to Earth, the people had to live down here among us, but they one day longed to return to the sky, so they left keys to point the way, so that one day, their descendants might regain what they had lost. It's a floating island city containing the things you would instantly connect to the Babylonians of Sonic's world, such as the anti-gravity crystals used to get to higher places in the ancient city. There's a good bit of connections to the Babylonians that could be found in Rush Adventure. There are a ton of hints that point to the ancient civilization surrounding Sky Babylon, such as an altar that raises Coral Cave, which holds the Jewel Scepter. They also built a submarine defense system under what became Pirate's Island, controlled by Captain Whiskers. It can be accessed through solving a puzzle that the Babylonians left behind. You could say that the similarities to what is found in the Soul Dimension is simply a parallel of Sonic's own dimension, but let's take a deeper dive into why it's possible that the Babylonians were dimension hoppers. Eggman and Eggman Nega themselves theorize that Sonic and Blaze worlds are connected not only by the two sets of emeralds, but also by the stars. In the Japanese version of Sonic Rider Zero, gravity, the arcs of the cosmos are referred to as the Hoshi no Sehitsu, the arc of the stars. With this information in mind, one can theorize that Sky Babylon possibly could have been the main homeland for the Babylonians, while Astro Babylon was the spaceship they used to travel between dimensions. Also, Blaze and Shugo Hei share a similar look and color scheme. That might be a coincidence though. It also might be that Blaze's people and the Babylonians work together like how the Enchidnas and Birds in Sonic's dimension were connected for a time, but I'll talk more about that later. Shout out to Autistic Shadow the Hedgehog over on Tumblr for this theory. Sonic and the Secret Rings also provide some solid evidence. The Arabian Night stories could have been based on the ancient Babylonian society mixed in with the culture of Sonic's world. Theory speculates that the Babylonians crash landed near what is now known in Sonic's world as the Middle East. Being the geniuses that they were, their impressive architecture and technology wowed the people of Earth, leading them to adopt many of the cultural styles exhibited by the Babylonians. This can be most explicitly seen in the aforementioned Arabian Night story that contains genies and floating ruins very similar to the Babylon Garden. The Ifrit, a large destructive being made of fire, is seen in these stories when Sonic traverses through the world. Ifrit is also seen in Sonic Rivals 2, summoned from a different dimension by Eggman Nega to destroy the world. This could very well be simply a coincidence, as I imagine different dimensions have their own versions of the same thing. But it being explicitly referred to as Ifrit, lends me to believe that the Babylonians at one point encountered this being and told stories about it to the people of Earth as the stories were being written. There is a floating abandoned city level called Sky Citadel. It's a bit of a tenuous connection in my opinion, as not much is known about this area, and as far as I'm aware, lore for the Sonic Boom games isn't really talked about. Interesting little fact to add to this theory. One of Lyric's conceptual designs depicted him as an owl, 
So maybe at some point Lyric was supposed to be representation for the Babylonians in the boom dimension? Would have been interesting. You could also say that Sky Citadel is simply a reference to the Echidna's Sky Sanctuary as seen in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. More evidence that lends itself to the possibility of them being dimension hoppers can be found through multiple Sonic games as far back as 1996. Yes, I'm saying that Sonic 3D Blast gives us some clues that tells us more about the Babylonians. In the opening cutscene of that game, it is literally stated verbatim them, flickies are mysterious birds. They live in another dimension and can travel anywhere through large rings. These same large rings are seen in the Sonic movie as Longclaw opens a portal to another planet using one. This means that the rings can vary in power, allowing those who use them to travel between dimensions, planets, and even in distorted worlds. These same large rings are also seen in Sonic 1 and 3 meaning that Sonic and possibly even Knuckles have been planet hopping and even dimension hopping since the start. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if the Babylonians helped the Enkidnas develop the star posts seen in Sonic 2 and 3, which also allowed for traveling to little pocket dimensions and worlds. You know, sometimes I wonder if Sonic Team truly meant for everything to be so connected. It's interesting to make these little connections when you do some deeper digging. Before I get to my favorite theory, here's a few side theories to sink your teeth into if you want. Shadow the Hedgehog is possibly an artificially made Babylonian. Shadow was created by Gerald Robotnik along with the help of Black Doom, leader of the Black Arms alien race. There isn't much here unless you could somehow make a connection to the Black Arms and the ancient Babylonians. Black Doom does look like a very ugly bird abomination looking thing if you look at him long enough. In fact, a lot of the Black Arms aliens come in the form of winged creatures. Those without wings usually sporting highlights on different parts of their body like the ancient Babylonians. Shadow and Jet do share similar features as you can see here. Shadow also tells Eggman that he will grant him one wish as if he was some genie. But this could be explained as he was made with the seven emeralds which are known to grant wishes. It is an interesting connection though even if there isn't much here. It's just funny to imagine Shadow being part bird. This dude is like something out of spliced at this point. This theory is about Sonic Frontiers. The game isn't out yet, but I saw an interesting post about how the Starfall Islands could be the islands that the Babylonians inhabited while stranded on Earth. Much like the multiple islands that they possibly inhabited in the Soul Dimension. It would make sense, they are called the Starfall Islands. The Babylonians used to wish upon falling stars to return to their home, the Ark of the Stars, Sonic and Blaze's dimension being connected by the power of the stars. Hey, this could mean that Blaze possibly makes an appearance in Frontiers. That would be cool. The cyberspace levels remind me of the cyberspace levels from Sonic Riders, so there is a lot of connections to be drawn here in my opinion. There's something interesting going on with the potential of the story for Sonic Frontiers, and if the Babylonians are a part of that, I'd be interested to see how they expand on the lore there. Now it's time for my favorite theory as it sort of ties into another Sonic theory video I made about the connection between the three islands in Sonic 1, 2, and 3. I believe that the Babylon rogues at some point inhabited the Pangaea that consisted of South Island, Westside Island, and Angel Island before it was split apart during the Chaos Incident. Evidence of a bird civilization are seen in a few levels in Sonic 1, 2, and 3, but I'm not too sure about 3 actually. The hieroglyphics are a bit hard to make out. These things might be birds, and I'm gonna stick with that. I have no idea about the origins of the Chaos Emeralds though. I believe in my other video, I said that the Enkidnas and birds found the emeralds scattered around the continent and worshipped the emeralds when they realized the stones were very powerful. I'm not too sure about that anymore. Maybe the Enkidnas found the emeralds but didn't know how to control their power. The Babylon rogues came along after being separated due to incurring the wrath of the gods for their thieving ways and unbelievable technological advancement. It's possible that they taught them how to use the emeralds because they would have had experiencing harnessing the power of emeralds based on the theory of them being from the soul dimension and working with those who protected the soul emeralds. And as we know, the chaos and soul emeralds are closely connected. After learning how to use the emeralds, the Enkendans began to build their own civilization as referenced in Sonic 2 and 3's Japanese manuals. Meanwhile, the rogues possibly mingled with the Enkendans while building their own civilization elsewhere on the continent. 
not using the power of the emeralds nearly as much as the Enkidnas did. Look at the levels of Sonic 1 and then look at the levels of Sonic 2 and 3. Sonic 1's levels are mostly ruins with two cities. Sonic's 2 and 3 contain entire cities, ancient ruins, entire pyramids made, the hidden palaces, etc. So maybe the birds learned their lesson after getting wrecked by the gods. Some possible conflicts arose between the neighboring tribes, resulting in the already separated Babylonians being reduced even more in numbers. The greed of Tikal's father, incurred the wrath of the protector of the Emerald Shrine, Chaos, who used the Emeralds to become the angry water god known as Perfect Chaos, causing devastation across the entire continent and almost the world before being stopped by Tikal, who used the Master Emerald to calm Chaos down and created Angel Island, putting an end to all the conflict. The remaining rogues managed to collect six of the seven Emeralds, using their power to carve out a piece of the continent that would drift across the sea, resulting in the creation of South Island. They would also create the distortions around South Island, which housed the six Emeralds. The remaining piece of land, left unmoved in the conflict, would become known as West Side Island. I really liked this theory, and the only connection I really had was that Knuckles was able to read the ancient text at the Gigan Rocks. People have tried to explain that away as Knuckles being a treasure hunter, but for me, it's more possible that he was simply taught to read Babylonian language at a young age before the remaining Enkidna died out, leaving him behind. The setting for Sonic Adventure has always been sort of a mystery. Its location in Sonic's world is unknown because there is no official map of Sonic's world. I know you can pinpoint to Unleashed or even use Sonic Forces as a reference, but because it always seems like the landmass in Sonic's world is constantly shifting in shape, it's hard to pinpoint where most games take place. Nevertheless, that hasn't stopped fans from trying to piece everything together, and as you guys know by now, I'm on my own little journey of trying to make the lore of Sonic make sense. So that's what I'll be doing today. I'll be attempting to prove that Sonic Adventure 1's setting takes place in and near the same island Sonic 2 takes place on, West Side Island. To lay the groundwork, West Side Island is the setting of Sonic 2. It's got multiple types of regions spread out across the assumingly large island, from valleys to ancient ruins, mountainous regions, jungle-like areas, etc. I'm going to be making connections to stages from both the released and beta versions of Sonic 2 to the released and beta versions of Sonic Adventure stages to reach the conclusion that the Mystic Ruins is indeed in West Side Island. First, we'll look at some aspects of the hub world itself. The easiest connection to make here is Tails' home, which is located on the edge of a cliff overlooking the sea. Tails is introduced in Sonic 2, and it's presumed that he lives on West Side Island, so that's evidence piece number one. The second thing we'll look at is the jungle area in the other section of the hub world for the Mystic Ruins. I would say this area is located near the Mystic Cave Zone. Allow me to explain. In Act 2 of Mystic Cave Zone in the Taxman version of Sonic 2, when you fall into the dreaded pit, you are taken to the Hidden Palace Zone, a place that alludes to the Hidden Palace area of Sonic 3 and allows Sonic to turn into Super Sonic once he completes the level. I've theorized in previous videos that the Lost World stage is the Hidden Palace stage from Sonic 2, but maybe it's just a part of it that Sonic hadn't discovered before could be an entirely different shrine altogether. In Sonic 2, Sonic enters the hidden palace from a cave pit, meaning that he could have possibly been at the lowest or near the lowest levels of the palace. In this section, after completing the water snake section of Lost World, the outside area shows that there are tons of ruins nearby, with trees covering the lower half of these pyramids, which leads me to believe that somewhere below these trees is where the entrance to the Mystic Cave lies. Like I said before, it's also possible that it's not the same palace as the hidden palace in Sonic 2, but simply a nearby one. This Lost World stage is the same pyramid seen in the flashbacks that Tikal shows multiple players throughout the story of Sonic Adventure 1. The place has decayed over time, and possibly initially brought to ruin by the wrath of Perfect Chaos. That's also a strong possibility. Either way, I'm convinced that this is near the Mystic Cave Zone. A little side note here. I saw a forum post speculating that the area where Eggman builds his base is the crater left behind by Angel Island, breaking away from the rest of the continent in the past. I myself am not sure if this is the case. The snake statue at the front of the shrine is pointed in the direction where the minecart is, and it's also pointed the same way in the past, opposite of the JPEG background meant to represent the greater area. If anything, that possibly means that around the area where Tails lives is the true location of where the Emerald Shrine was in the past. So in my opinion, Tails lives near where the original Emerald Altar would be. The area separated by the bridge in the past wasn't large, 
but obviously over the course of three to four thousand years new land began to form to speculate even further the chow garden in the mystic ruins hub world has some of the same leftover structures that were possibly left behind in the chaos incident that destroyed the emerald altar chow did live near the emerald shrine and they continue to live in this certain section of the mystic ruins this specific chow garden could be the actual breaking point between the emerald altar and the pathway to the shrine all right let's circle back to the jungle area of the mystic ruins i feel like this is a bit of a reach but this is where the beta of sonic 2 comes in these mock-up screenshots of Sonic 2 show Sonic in a desert area. Sand Hill, as seen in Sonic Adventure 1, is a desert area. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock! Let me clarify. I know that the reason why Sand Hill exists is because Sonic Team saw multiple people sandboarding in South America while they were developing ideas for Sonic Adventure, but I think it's a funny coincidence that there was meant to be a desert area in Sonic 2, and then there was one in Sonic 3, and now in SA1 the game that draws connections between Sonic 2 and 3 through its story. Tails' flashback also happens in the jungle section of the Mystic Ruins, which kinda doesn't make sense because as far as I'm aware, Sonic and Tails first met near Emerald Hill, but at the end of the flashback they do enter a clearing from the jungle, so maybe the area beyond what we explore in the Mystic Ruins was where the Emerald Hill alongside the Mystic Cave Zones were located. The next and final stage we'll be looking at is Windy Valley. It's a stage that in both versions is depicted to be high above the clouds, much like Sonic 2's Hilltop Zone. While the color scheme might not match up between the final version of Windy Valley and Hilltop Zone, both stages have backgrounds of large orange-reddish mountaintops high above the clouds. The beta version of Sonic Adventures Windy Valley, however, does share a similar color scheme to Hilltop. I'm positive that this is not a coincidence. The story of Sonic Adventure expands on the two versions of an ancient civilization story in the Japanese manuals of Sonic 2 and 3. So I'm positive that Sonic Team wanted to create a connected world in the present day to give players a familiar feeling while playing through these levels. The very last thing that in my mind confirms that Sonic Adventure 1's Mystic Ruins is indeed in Westside Island is the bridge connecting this ancient palace to the Emerald Shrine. It was broken apart when Tikal used the Master Emerald's power to create Angel Island meaning that at one point, Angel Island and Westside Island were once connected. As far as I'm aware, it's pretty clear that the Mystic Ruins were always there and only recently discovered. That along with how the bridge near the modern Emerald Altar is broken and the decaying ruins is the same one from the past could only mean that the Mystic Ruins and the Emerald Altar were once connected, meaning that Angel Island and Westside Island were, at one point, part of a larger Pangaea a supercontinent. I made an entire video detailing this theory using evidence from the classic games, so go check that out when you have the time. That's all the evidence I could gather that points to Sonic Adventure's mystic ruins being placed on the West Side Island. The only glaring issue is the train station being present. But I believe that West Side Island is not too far off from human civilization. I believe researchers had a railway connecting the island to the city made in order to explore the island more. It makes a ton of sense that Sonic Adventure 1 takes place on and around West Side Island. Sonic Team created a steady buildup of lore with the classic trilogy. And from the looks of it, from promotional art to the final game, Sonic Adventure was always meant to expand upon this lore and make it clear what was going on. I think some of that was lost due to Sonic Team's writers seemingly preferring to leave things up for interpretation in the early 3D games, but some deeper looking makes things very clear. Shadow the Hedgehog's existence has generated a ton of discussion stemming from the events that take place in the story of this game. Shadow the Hedgehog features a whopping 22 levels, 10 different endings, and 326 different optional paths that you can take to get to these endings. Now you're probably asking, who the hell has the time to uncover all these pathways? The answer is, six year old me. I will not be taking any more questions at this time. You only need to do 10 paths in order to gain access to the true final story which houses the canon ending to the game. This has spawned conversation about the topic I will be discussing in this video. What is the true path of Shadow the Hedgehog? Now it seems like an extremely daunting task to look through over 300 paths to decipher which one is the actual true path, but there is a way to simplify this process. You must look at what happens in the final story and take into account Shadow's motivations that are laid out in the opening cutscene of the game. In this cutscene, Shadow contemplates the meaning behind the weird visions he's been having, 
mainly about Maria's death. This falls in line with Sonic Heroes, where Shadow very clearly doesn't remember what happened to him before the events of SA2. Shadow is approached by Black Doom, who tells him that if he gathers the seven emeralds, he will reveal Shadow's origins to him. Shadow goes ahead with this plan and sets off to search for the seven Chaos Emeralds. The last story has many events unfold due to events that transpired in some of the levels leading up to the final story. These things must be in line with the true path we uncover. Shadow doesn't fight Sonic or Black Doom, so any ending where this happens before last story isn't canon. Eggman must be alive, so every possible path where Eggman gets karate chopped to death by Shadow isn't canon as well. The next thing is that the Chaotix have to have found the computer room and used data they collected to hack into the system. This means that every possible path that doesn't go through Prison Island and Cosmic Fall in the same route is not canon. The gun commander seems to have a change of heart about Shadow and the Professor at the end of the final story. But there had to be some developments along the way to get him there. So any route that doesn't introduce the commander and features a scene where he confronts Shadow on the arc isn't canon because it wouldn't make sense for him to be so hell bent about getting rid of Shadow, not confront him directly at any point, and then do a 180 in the final story. The commander also extends an olive branch to Shadow, apologizing to him in expert mode, which acts as an after story to the main game once the last story is completed. I'm counting this as canon because it provides some insight as to why Shadow would join Gun in Sonic 06. Lastly, Eggman reveals to Shadow that he is the real deal and not an android, so any path that doesn't have Shadow end up in Iron Jungle is not canon, as that is where the Shadow android stuff comes into play. I also want to make it clear that some missions that you don't do that involve warring factions is also canon. For example, in this canon path, if you do the dark mission on Prison Island, the hero mission is also canon regardless because Charmy had to have found the discs in order for Team Chaotix to use the data to hack into the Ark's computer as seen in the last story. It just wouldn't make sense otherwise. If you need another example, let's look at Sky Troops. If you do either Eggman or Black Doom's mission, nothing in the overall plot changes either way in the last story. The war fought between Gun, Eggman's army, and Black Doom's aliens ultimately doesn't matter to the plot, as the central story, no matter what you do, is to obtain the seven Chaos Emeralds. All right, let's get into it. In Westopolis, the mission that falls most in line with the story so far is the neutral mission, which requires Shadow to collect the Chaos Emerald in the Go Ring at the end of the stage. The hero and dark missions require Shadow to defeat a set number of aliens or gun units respectively. Shadow gains two emeralds by doing the neutral mission. His only goal so far is to simply find the seven emeralds. Doing the neutral mission takes you to Glyphic Canyon, where, once again, the neutral mission is the one that aligns most with Shadow's current objective. The dark mission requires you to activate five temple jewels to empower the aliens, while the hero mission is by and large the same one as in Westopolis. Instead of helping Sonic, you're helping Knuckles. And to clarify, you can get the third emerald no matter which mission you do, but Shadow hasn't aligned himself with either side, so there's no reason to do the hero or dark missions just yet. Shadow's search for the emeralds leads him to Prison Island, and this is where the shift in Shadow's motivation begins to change. Going back to the destroyed Prison Island makes him recall memories of being locked away by Gun after Maria saved his life on the Ark. Shadow gains some clarification about what happened to him, but not everything is clear. Black Doom gives Shadow the usual mission of wiping out military presence to allow the aliens to take over. The hero mission sees Charmy B ask Shadow for help, collecting some top secret discs. The neutral mission is to simply head for the gold ring, which gets you the fourth emerald, but the following level sky troops doesn't offer any real plot significance. There's two warring factions in that level, and the neutral path offers no chaos emerald, so it would be non-canon based on the rules I established earlier. Please ignore what I said here. I'm not sure how I didn't catch this contradiction when I was editing the original video. It wasn't until a comment pointed out that Sky Troops is referenced in one of the early issues of the Sonic IDW comics that I caught this mistake. What I said here is wrong, and what I said before is correct. Sky Troops is canon, and every other event dealing with any of the three armies fighting is as well, because the war itself is simply a backdrop for the story. If I state otherwise at any point after this, I'm wrong. That's it. Back to the video. There's no real reason to help Charmy in Prison Island. The most logical path to take here is the Dark Mission, as Black Doom did promise Shadow he would reveal the past to him as he gathered the Emeralds. Feelings of frustration at being locked away would come up for Shadow due to being on Prison Island, so the Dark Mission makes sense story-wise. Doing the Dark Mission also gets you the fourth Chaos Emerald. 
Shadow's memories are still hazy, so Black Doom shows Shadow a scene from 50 years ago on the space colony arc where Shadow and Maria are running away from gun soldiers. As Shadow progresses through the level, he regains his memories with Maria about what happened on the arc. So the most likely path to take here in this level named The Doom is to help Maria save ARC researchers who had been injured due to Gunn's radical takeover of the space colony. Shadow is now back in the present on Iron Jungle, still unaware of what it all means. He encounters a multitude of Shadow androids. This falls in line with what we saw at the end of Team Dark story in Sonic Heroes, where it's implied that Shadow could possibly be an android. Shadow spots Eggman heading back to his base and with Omega's help chases him down. It's important to do the hero mission here, as doing the mission lands you in Cosmic Fall, which has an ending where Eggman doesn't get killed by Shadow. Defeating the Eggman boss here in Iron Jungle lands you the 5th Chaos Emerald. If you do the Dark mission, you end up in a stage called Black Comet, where the hero mission leads you to killing Eggman, and the Dark mission leads you to fighting Sonic, with Shadow ultimately swearing loyalty to Black Doom, which as we all know, isn't what happens in the end. Doing the neutral mission lands you in Lava Shelter, and sets you on the Shadow as an Android path. Obviously that pathway can't be canon as well, seeing as how both missions in Lava Shelter leads Shadow to once again killing Eggman. During the boss fight for Iron Jungle's hero mission, Shadow is lied to by Eggman, who tells him he's an android. The reason why Eggman lies is never made clear. He doesn't think this Shadow is one of his many Shadow androids, and he tells him the truth during the Devil Doom boss fight in the last story, so it's just a red herring I guess. If the Shadow android stuff was always meant to be a misdirection to make the player believe Shadow could possibly be one, they literally failed by the end of Team Dark story in Sonic Heroes, because while they did try to make you think that Shadow was an android, as I said earlier, at the very end, they just leave a big hint that it's the real Shadow anyway. A more interesting story would have been uncovering why Eggman has an entire army of android versions of the ultimate life form, but that element is never really talked about. Oh well. On to Cosmic Fall. Shadow's journey takes him to the space colony arc with more questions than answers. Here, the gun commander encounters Shadow, revealing his connection to Maria, and blames Shadow for the destruction that happened on the arc that ended up killing Maria. The gun commander then tries to kill Shadow. The hedgehog dodges it with ease and tells the commander that he will gladly hand himself over if it's revealed that Shadow is solely responsible for the arc incident 50 years ago. The gun commander, unsure of what to believe at this point, falls to his knees, leaving Shadow to find the truth about what happened. In Cosmic Fall, you either do the Dark Mission, which is simply get to the 6th Emerald, or you help Vector find the infamous Computer Room. The Dark Mission is the correct choice here, because if you do the Hero Mission, it's implied that Shadow kills himself, which is insane on, on so many levels. How the hell is this game rated E10+. Plus? You also defeat Black Doom here, which isn't supposed to happen yet. The Dark Mission ending sees you fight Eggman, obtain the 7th Emerald, leading to Shadow affirming to himself that he is indeed the ultimate life form and the protector of the Ark, telling Eggman to leave and never return. This ending seems to suggest that Shadow continues to live in solitude on the Ark, which I don't think is too far out of the realm of possibility to be honest with you. Shadow is last seen on the Ark at the end of the final story. I know he says he's leaving the past behind him, and the Ark would be a part of that past. It's also possible that being on the Ark also gives him peace of mind. He does decide to team up with Gun, so the trauma of what happened seems to not affect him anymore. We stand the emotional growth of a three foot hedgehog. With the seven emeralds obtained, Shadow heads to the Black Comet and the events of the last story unfold. This entire route that I've laid out here is also known as Path 153 also known as the Together with Maria path. It covers all the bases needed to make a concise story that lines up with the final story of the game. It's not the greatest story ever, but it makes some sense and that's the goal at the end of the day. Let me know what you think about this route. Is there any other route in Shadow that makes sense? As I was doing research for this, I saw a few people point out that Izuka has stated that the supposed canon route is the pure hero path, but that leads to you defeating Black Doom before the last story, so it doesn't make sense to me how that could be it. If anyone has a link to an article where he says this, I would love to read it. Shout out to Sonic Lore posting over on Twitter. Pretty much every time I have a theory in my mind that I want to make a video on, they end up being one of the many places I look to for information. Really cool account that gives context to and clears up any misconceptions about Sonic games and their lore. While you're here, 
check out the other videos in my series of Sonic theories. That's all I got for now. Peace.